I think I'm still going to uh, I'm going to switch the the topics I was going to hit upon because I, I um, given this is my uh, my mess up I'm going to give some time for those that may because we always have some folks that join a few minutes later because I definitely want as many folks of our our districts on when I'm discussing legislative session because I I need their help uh, we need their help all of us need their help um, with a opportunity that's available so I want to make sure. We have as many of them on as uh, we can. So welcome to our uh, January, our new year 2022 edition of our, our webcast. Appreciate you all joining uh, today in the various sundries that we have snow in a good number of districts today. So they're having a, a snow day. Um, so they're watching uh, you know, all the different places that they may be uh, watching. So you, you see the agenda that I shared with you. I'm gonna go through parts of that. Um, all through this, probably I'll be sharing some of the feedback that you uh, provided us in December um, is uh, in, in, in relationship to these uh, to these type of topics. Um, the first one I want to hit upon, and I'm going I'm to share my screen here and try to bring up uh, a study. Let's see here if I get to the right one. These messages are popping up. Let me get to the, uh, make sure I'm at the right one, because this is the Education Superhighway is the one I want to be on uh, to start out with. So let me go back, try to share my screen from there. Just a minute. Here we go. Now you also start seeing this one. You got it. Got it. Yep. So from the feedback that we got from districts, it um, you know it talked about um, one of the things we talked about that we did well in the past um, 12 months, but it really gets kind of blurred in the past 20 months is the um, the internet access beyond the school campus, last mile uh, internet type of thing. And you, you, there's two poll questions. Just a reminder on on Go Soapbox. There's two poll questions that we would like you to uh, uh, to take a look at and and, uh, uh, and, and obviously you can comment any time uh, during this uh, that, that you see it about this topic about internet access beyond the school campus. This is from Education Superhighway. Um, it's a nonprofit group. They Their work has been acquired uh, by Connected Nation. And just to give you a historical perspective, um, Connected Nation started out, is, started out as Connect Kentucky. Um, and its mission was not a K-12 one because we had a good relationship uh, with um, with Connect Kentucky. They, re they realized all of our districts were connected and we were the first to do that. But then they recognized early on um, in the late 90s, early 2000s of the importance of trying to get Internet access beyond the school campus. And because of their success uh, and other states want to do something similar, I think Ohio and Tennessee, they had initiatives called Connect Tennessee, Connect Ohio, and they recognize every state had it, so they became Connected Nation. So if you take a, if you go to Connected Nation, you will see their roots are Kentuckians. Um, um, uh, then and now uh, lead the organization. It was interesting. We had nothing to do with it, where they acquired uh, to continue on the work of Education Superhighway, and so this is a national look uh, across the nation. There's a couple of teaching points. I'm going to just spend tons of time on this because obviously you can do that. But it supports something that we've been trying to tell folks during the pandemic. There was the, there was this feeling that, first of all, during the pandemic, we were dealing with, and the reason you hear me over and over telling you about our schools are connected, it, it, it's problematic when we don't have just an incredibly high percentage of our population and our uh, private sector and our public sector leaders that know of our, all of our schools are connected. So that's why you hear me say it and say, tell them any time, because I run into the situations over and over again about them not realizing that and think, well, we got to get these schools connected, not realizing they are. So part of this is really putting your energy really, really needs to be. The other big thing that we were, were dealing with during the pandemic is a very large miscalculation about the number of K-12 students that currently didn't have enough internet to do their schoolwork. Um, and it got skewed to 40 to 50 percent, and it's nowhere near uh, that high. Um, 
and we got down to the you know the three percent um, of the remaining students, two percent of the remaining students uh, in, in Kentucky K-12. The other key thing when you look at this, and you'll hear me talk about this frequently, broadband is not the same. It's not synonymous with the word internet. It's related, but it's not synonymous. Broadband is a speed. You can do a very large percentage of what you need to do in, in, in K-12 related without broadband speeds um, at home. Um, but, you know, broadband is this, this word where folks think that uh, it, it, so that's, that's the, the, the thing as you take a look at this. Broadband is a speed and a good portion of the time it is massively over what is needed for K-12. Not 100 percent. Nothing, nothing in life is 100 percent or 100 percent perfect. But the, the teaching point is you take a look at this and they're big chunks. They really found out that um, when you're taking a look at the spectrum, uh, you know, of people not uh, connected, um, is, is this is, this is how it plays out, which I think is a is an inter very interesting way to look at it. Um, so, and this is you see the number of households, the number of people within those households. So you see what I've been telling people for quite some time in Kentucky during the pandemic, and afterwards, and all the midst of it as they're doing all these studies is a huge part of the issue is not having at least one good internet option available beyond the school campus. It's those households being able to afford it. We found that out firsthand during the pandemic. There was places in Kentucky that, uh, you know, and this is where we got in that discussion that we, we've gone over again and again, where the, the school building cannot, for a variety of reasons, operational E-rate reasons, be the internet service for homes. Um, it's just like you don't do that for uh, your electricity. You don't extend the school, the electricity of the school to the homes. You don't do that for the water. You don't do that for the gas. Same thing with the Internet. But folks were looking at the Internet to, to, to the school systems to immediately solve that and be, be the provider, the utility provider. And we pushed back very strongly on that. And um, for a variety of reasons, we won't go over again today, but those were covered uh, in the past. Or if you want us to do that, we, we can do that. But what we were finding was it wasn't an issue. They didn't have internet for a very large percentage. It was the parents can't afford it. Uh, in, in one particular area, they had four or five different providers in that area. They were looking to just run a line from the, the, the school system out to the, um, uh, or, or, or you know, by say like this, uh, uh, to, the, to the neighborhoods near there. But the really issue was initial and ongoing is the ability to pay. And this really supports that to where you see a very high percentage. This is a national snapshot um, where you have, you know, 18.1 million of, of the remaining amount that don't have it. When you, you take a look at look at this one um, and you add this one onto it as well, these two numbers together, um, you see a very high percentage of this is they can't afford an option that's there. And that's therefore why you see one of the poll questions and kind of see how you all think you, how this is going to play out. We all, it really, the poll question is two, uh, two different ones. One is for the remaining students that we have that still aren't connected beyond the school campus uh, to do internet, they, have, they don't have it. What is the top reason, the inhibitor? Because I think it helps educate folks so they think they got to run out and build something. And obviously there's a, there's a percentage that's true. But the, 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 the bigger issue to me has always been, even if you build it, they can't afford it. And um, even of the 7.1 billion households without available internet, there's a percentage of that. I don't know if it's half, that even if you build it, you, 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 you provide at least one last mile wire to wireless broadband speed infrastructure. Is, is it half? Is it 75% of that? Is even if you do it, they can't afford it. So I've always told folks, keep, keep in mind on the radar scheme, the affordability, just not to go out and build it, but can the families actually afford it? Now you see this, this 3 million here, is they have it available. This is a group that has it available, but they have chosen to say, you know what? I don't, I don't want it. Uh, I don't want broadband uh, internet. Now, when you break out that $3 million, you, you can do your own looking at the study is there's a very high percentage of folks within that three million says, you know what, what I get with my wireless smartphone and its ability to do a hotspot is enough for me. Uh, I don't need anything else beyond that. There's also a percentage of population 
and it's, it gets smaller and smaller. It says, I don't need anything at all. Um, so here's how the breakout is when you add those, you know, together. Um, and uh, you can see it's really at 7.1 million. It's 25% they're unconnected. Um, it really, they don't have even an option. But once again, I want to remind folks, even if you go and build it, doesn't mean you can afford it, which was one of the main purposes of this study uh, that they that they spent time on. Uh, and they, they talk about, you know, here um, is the uh, the communities, you know, the poverty level, you know, plays into folks not having it uh, at all. And um, here's a here's a so here's a an important teaching point that I'll, I'll hit on and we'll, we'll we'll back off of it here. The federal lifeline program has been around for a really long time. Um, came around around the same time, maybe beforehand, that E-rate was established in the 1990s. The E-rate program, federal E-rate program, part of the Universal Service Fund. What's proven true over the course of time is you can see a very low percentage of folks have taken advantage of the Lifeline program. They qualify. They know the percentage of folks that that have that do not have the in income levels to afford it, and they're eligible for the Lifeline program. And they they're not, you know, for whatever reason, they're not getting it. And there's you know there's billions of dollars that's available in that that pool of money. Same thing with what we call the EBB funds. What we've told you about. This is one of the ones that came out as, from the pandemic, it is once again a huge amount, you know, billions of dollars there, you know, $50 a month paying for uh, uh, internet service for low-income families, pays for even a device to, to put in the homes. And you see just a really tiny percentage of them are taking advantage of that. And a lot of that is just awareness and, um, uh, you know, that the, the program's available, but, you know, whose job is it to make them Aware. Now you see, this is the the missions of education. You know, make people aware, and then you know, try to gain the trust uh, for them to 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 do that. And then the enrollment challenges for them to be doing it. So a big part of what the education superhighway is is doing is trying to um, you know help. And this is not just gate geared to K twelve, but make these folks that are very low income aware and help them go through the paperwork. I wish I could say that the um, the EBP program has been simpler, and my push all during it was make it simpler and less embarrassing for folks that are low income to sign up for it. And it, it's, it's pretty much very similar to the Lifeline program, except it has significantly more money available to it. The Lifeline program was, I think it was close to $10 a month. It wasn't quite $10. That's significantly different than $50 a month to pay for internet service for a household. Um, the other part of this strategy is, um, uh, and once again, you can spend time and look at these. I'm not going to delve into them. Main, my, my role is mainly to make you aware of them. Is Once again, this is not connecting to the school's internet service, this uh, strategy three. But I know during the pandemic, folks had, um, you, know, place, you know, folks in low-income housing, and we're looking for ways to connect them. And there are financial incentives and financial uh, ways uh, and money available to help connect uh, initially an ongoing pay for Wi-Fi in these low-income apartment buildings. It doesn't have anything to do with using the K-12's internet services, and it, and it, and it, and it should, should never do that. But it, but it allows the different strategies. Now, what I don't know, and I'm sure there is a way that someone pushed it, how does that affect like trailer parks? It's the same scenario, low-income housing. Is, is there something available to help out with trailer parks with this? And I've not got to ask them um, if it helps out with that, uh, with that situation. So, but um, it does go back to um, um, just making sure you're aware of this and, and, and thinking through what do we think is, you know, the school district's responsibility, um, you know, in helping, you know, students without internet access beyond the school campus. Before the pandemic, it was a really small percentage. I want to say 10 districts of our 172 at the time um, did that, but really it was really targeted with, with very specific classes, not necessarily all the students without it in there. So this has always been, I'm not, no one's judging. None of these things or these questions are judging. If the, you know, you answer the question of, we, we see that totally apparent responsibility, there's no judgment associated with it. And there's nothing saying, 
well, Katie, the agency says that you should take that on. We're not saying that at all. But I think we're just trying to see from your, your responses to the Go Soapbox questions is, where, where do you think you all land on this going forward? Uh, obviously, um, with a different stage of the pandemic, is, uh, is it really, uh, you know, how much of a district is really, are they buying hotspots for district? And nothing's 100%. You always will say some, and you always will hear me fuss about the word some, because some can mean one. Um, and I realize that is being greatly reduced um, after the pandemic when there was really, a, you know, we had, you know, districts at 100 percent, you know, for extremely long periods of time. But once again, from the feedback that, you know, that that are received is, um, you know, that is on the minds of folks. So I think it'd be helpful for yourself and for each other to kind of see where you all land on this. And if someone could bring up the, the go soapbox questions, I think those are. Four and five for us to kind of take a look at what folks are doing. Just like any with Go Soapbox, if you don't have a chance now, um, go ahead and um, um, you know do that sometime during the webcast so we can see it. Because as you know, we do a copy paste of those. All right. So, so this is the one we're saying. Where do you think this? Um, um, where do you think this lands uh, as far as the reasons this, your your existing students don't have it? So I'm just going to read through that. Okay. So I think this is pretty interesting. You know, the, the um, the part that I remember during the pandemic, and this was a small percentage, and anyone knows me, I, I try to make sure people, and I always will say is something 99% broke for 9%, 99%, or 1% broke for 1%, and you don't ignore, ignore that 1%. But we had during the pandemic, uh, internet hotspots that were available to parents, and for a variety of reasons, they did not pick them up. Um, and so there was that, I would always tell folks that uh, that percentage, but it does show uh, when you're taking a taking a look at this, um, you know, it's 70 percent uh, where this is a financial issue. So, mm -hmm. you know, they have it. and They can't afford it is what I look at. That is your your initial response there. And even if there was one put in, they can't afford it. Um, and so it goes back to that's a that's a really high chunk of the finance. So as you're talking to folks and, and their intentions, I think, you know, I, I know they're good. I so we got to get Internet to the homes is that they're all thinking this gap is 100% something's got to be built, either wireless or, or, or wired, and it's financial. And so that's the reason Education Superhighway is spending time on this. And I don't know exactly, you know, and, I, and we're not telling a district, hey, listen, what efforts are you doing uh, to make folks aware? Let me see what, what five is. Now I'm, I'm kind of going over to the question five, so if you can bring that, that one up. Yeah, I'm looking at what you got there. I'm just reading through it and letting folks kind of get that as well. And David, as a reminder, that's so we're, we're referencing or referring to um, the the remaining five percent of students um, as reported, or that that yeah. lack internet access at home, or not the remaining two percent of students who lack it um, beyond the school campus. School campus, yeah, right. So yeah. I'm glad you made that point, Marty. So we, yeah. we, we purposely asked this the question, how many do not have it that last mile wired or wireless, enough internet, not necessarily broadband. We mentioned before, broadband speeds are not necessary to do um, uh, everything you need to do educationally, a very high percentage of it. So it's 5%. And then, but we found in early on in the pandemic, there was how that 5%, and this is consistent, there was 3% that found someplace near them. There was a household near them that allowed them to use it. Um, they found some other method uh, to get it down. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know the role and, you know, and people can comment on Go Soapbox or in, or in chat with what, what kind of things the districts are doing to make sure they're aware. Uh, because, you know, this first time I'm really seeing, you know, that number that high without saying, well, Katie says we got to do it. You don't. You don't have to. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the part is we see from the Education Superhighway Report just an incredibly high percentage of low-income parents 
are not taking advantage of those. And so the question is why? And is it is it an awareness? Is it okay? I got it, but I need someone to help me walk through it. You know, there, you have a percentage of you make them aware of it, and they don't care. Um, and there's always that with anything that you do. Um, so I don't I don't have a good feel for the why those numbers are so short. But it is it is tragic that just this huge amount of it, money is available from your responses. You know, 70, 75 percent of the issue is financial. Is they either they they have one and they can't afford it. Even if it was built, they can't afford it. Um, and so you have all these people rushing to build stuff. Um, or they're not aware as it's, it's a problem we've had, you know, even with cats is they don't re recognize something's already been built. Uh, it's not that's not the issue. It's the ongoing financial cost issue. Um, so thanks. Thanks for that, that feedback. And I hope you spend some time looking at that study and hope it helps you within your district of uh, additional, you know, tool in the toolbox of there's a very low percentage. And I don't know if you have something to measure the percentage of your your folks that are doing that. So let's move on to. Okay. the Yes. Well, I was just I was just going to mention the confirmation from the federal, you know, the national report, but also understanding for us in Kentucky um, to kind of, you know, just to understand the point about the financial impact and and doubling down uh, on on the the issue of um, not just making folks aware, um, but but potentially using that, uh, you know, national report locally as well to compare to where we are in Kentucky. It's not it's not as large a number as the point that we we keep making. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you'll see the Kentucky stat in there. If you go down, you'll see the Kentucky report. Uh, that one, once again, is you, you have to add up all the pieces to really make sure how much of this is a really a financial issue. And that actually goes above. I always thought it was equally a, a problem. It's actually more of a financial and we don't we don't take it off, but it actually gives some some good backing of this is a financial issue. Um, so let's talk about the legislative session. Um, Lisa Moore plays a thousand roles for us, um, including her her current role is helping us keep up with the legislative session. So, Lisa, you and I are going to talk a little bit. Is there what would you like to share with the audience about what's what's going on uh, with the legislative session that's related to education technology? Uh, well, David, there's not a whole lot that is very specific to education technology. Uh, of course, this year the House introduced their budget before the governor introduced his, but the governor introduced his last Thursday, and it is very education-centered. Uh, There's a lot of money to be spent, uh, and he's allocated a good portion of funds to different things within education. So, of course, one of the things that is in the governor's proposal is uh, the restoring of our CATS funds which we really, really, really want to advocate for. Uh, we've been trying to do this for several years and several budget sessions. So um, so I know you want to talk some more about that. We've got about 60 education-related bills that have been submitted and um, probably won't see a lot of movement on any bills if people are interested in following any of those um, until after the 26th. There was a House Education Committee scheduled for two o'clock today that did get canceled. Um, so we'll be closely uh, reviewing the differences between the House budget and the governor's proposal. And uh, there is a comparison being done in-house right now by our Office of Financial Management. So they'll be letting us know exactly what the differences are between the two. We're on day 10. <laughs> Uh, thanks. I'm just taking a look at maybe some initial um, go soapbox questions related uh, or, or answers related to this. So let me make sure I want to bring everyone into our team huddle to explain the finances. Uh, this, this is super important. We always try to be very upfront of how the money works. We even spent, you know, we spent a lot of time with our own staff so they understand how the money works because there's this great thing. Why don't we go do X, Y, and Z? Well, we can't do that because there's not a new funding source to purchase that. Therefore, we must, uh, to do that, we have to stop doing something, meaning we stop funding it. Um, so the course of time, and we all remember the housing market collapse, um, but we've had others related to COVID over the years. I want to make sure you understand the, the, the impact of it is financially. Is, um, and these, I don't know for some people, and the number gets so huge, I can't keep up with them. But if you take a look at the KETS funding, 
That's been reduced by $4.1 million, you know, since 1992. Now, I want to make sure you understand is we start out with $19.5 million in cuts in 1992. It's now down to 15.3. That's a $4.1 million cut. That's, you know, that's assumed that there's not a cost of living increase in anything since 1992. We know there is. That's assuming not one new service, not one new upgrade happens, not one more bit, bit of bandwidth is needed. That's all bad assumptions. Um, so, you know, I want to, you know, this is kind of when you sometimes, um, you know, with our family and even with some children, we've had to bring them in the huddle and say, this is how, this is why this is happening. We don't have an unlimited source of funds. Um, the other part that's happened during this time is our, you know, high speed network, which people uh, surely recognize during the pandemic and since then with all the things being bought, was also cut by $1.2 million. We've been cut at least, um, you know, $5.3 million. Uh, and we also, our IT Academy took a cut within that um, as, as well. So as we talk about, well, I want, you know, when I, I got the feedback uh, from, you know, read every line, every statement, once again, appreciate everyone doing that. Um, uh, by the way, when you read through that, it's like a six hour read once, and I've done it twice. Um, uh, but it's it's fat you know it's fabulous stuff and I uh, you know appreciate um, uh, and, and I guess what I say there's there we want we want folks to highlight what we've done well want to keep on doing well you know what can we get better at what should our 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 goals be very high up and all that was hey we may we're really happy about you know the cats offers you know remaining you know at this level we're we're also really happy um, about the increase in bandwidth speeds. And we're happy that you're happy. So this is the reason we're bringing you into this huzzle. You will not be happy uh, in the future if we do not do something to restore those cuts. Th this is the time. We put in additional budget requests. You know, we have part of our staff, uh, Rebecca Bright, Amy Young, you know, Mike Lettingham and, and his team, and all of us, all of us could get there. And, and uh, most of you know, over the years, I, you know, I go at bat whenever I'm given in at bat by the legislature and I make those justifications. And we've been successful in those. But the number one best way in my 30 years to get an increase is when the district asks for it. That is number one. And I'm going to give you two examples over time. You said, well, I'm just I'm just a, I'm a single person. I'm just a single dis, you know, person in a district in this tiny district or in this district. And what difference can I make? I'm going to give you two historical ones uh, to where these two individuals directly led to us getting an you know, increase in KETS funding uh, over the course of years, some kind of something raised over the course of time. Charlotte Wright from Anderson County and Marita Horn from Pike County, different periods of time. Those two individuals went and met with their both their, their house representative and their senators and, and explained to them why it was important to restore a cut uh, or to increase funding. Those two individuals led to it because once they they communicated with their legislators um, their local legislators that got momentum and eventually you know legislature you know uh, you know approached us and said hey, this is something you all want yes it is it is something that's needed statewide it benefits every school district directly the thing that we're asking to be restored impacts you directly all of you talked about or very high percentage you talked about the people side of ed tech and I would agree with you. And every time I get in front of the audience, I talk about it being underfunded, particularly the technicians, but the importance of the digital learning coaches. The importance is to have someone in your district that's keeping up with data and also cybersecurity. So when we talk about raising the, the, the doing something about the cut with this $4.6 million that was in the governor's budget, what that does is it's, it's meant for to go to an offer that you use for, and it's in the description of additional budget requests. That's how we describe it. This will go to districts to do something about the people side of ed tech, help them out with replacement when all this money runs out, uh, and also help deal with the bandwidth growth in the future. This is the time. This is the time. There is a budget surplus. Now, in the House version of the budget, as Lisa was mentioning, for the first time in history that I'm aware of, is a House presented theirs before the governor's office. There's nothing that prevents that, but they did. The, the House budget did not have that in there. The Senate has not seen it yet. This is the time for you to discuss, have a discussion with 
um, your House and Senate folks, and, and you can say, what's the right path to do that within your district? We can only carry the ball so far. We've carried it. It's an additional budget request. It's all there. The data that we have, we put together supports it being put in place. And by the way, what the governor put is pros and does not everything, it didn't restore all the cuts. You know, it stores $4.6 million of the cuts, not the 4.5.3, but it's better than zero. The impacts of this in the future are pretty significant. All of you are pretty happy about us, us increasing your bandwidth. But let me tell you what that, the funding source is doing that. It's the CARES money, which we know has a shot clock that runs out in 2024. So that's the funding source. There's not a there's not a brand new ongoing one. And so that's why I tell folks, and when we did this proposal, and even when we use that money for the bandwidth upgrades, because we realize all of you are, you know, quickly moving one to one. You've also everything is going to be it's managed through the through your, your internet service, whether it's your HVAC system, it's your security system. We recognize that. So as you go to them, you talk to them, folks, say, you know what, these are the three things. If you raise that back up, you raise that cut. You restore the cuts. I think you've taken us back above it. It's restoring the cuts. Is it allows us to do something about the technology staff that we are just overwhelmed. It allows us to keep the digital learning coaches when this money runs out. It allows us to do something about addressing cybersecurity, either with a person on our staff or to hiring that service. Same thing with, with, with your data. It also allows you to do replacement. I saw how many of you count on, which is worrisome, the cats offer nearly solely to do what you need to do. If you really count on it that much, this is your time to stand up and don't don't look around so somebody else is going to do that for me. If we have a large amount of folks doing that, say this is important. This directly impacts everything you ask for. The big things that I saw from that feedback, it addresses them. But it takes you taking a step. We we count we know counting. So that's why you see is it takes overt, you know, initially and ongoing to try to get to these legislators to talk about it. This is the time. We will, you know, this is the biggest budget surplus I think they've ever had. And I understand they're thinking about ongoing costs. This is the time. This is the time for you to do it to get to your House members who had it zeroed out, didn't have that in there. This is the time to get with your senators. And also is they, they usually come together in a joint budget meeting where they have, you know, certain percentages of the House and Senate. You all know if you don't know, I can, we can tell you who are the leaders. Who's your, you know, who, who's leader of the House and Senate? Who is typically on those? Those are typically your leadership positions in the House and Senate. Those are especially crucial. If you have one of those in your that your district is part of, those are incredibly uh, important because they're usually part of setting the budget for either House or Senate. Or when that joint committee comes together, things can be added on very short notice. So we're counting on you. I mean, we, we, we carry the ball, our, our staff knows, and we've taken it. We have put together a package and we are ready to go. I'm ready to go talk to anyone uh, in you know, you know, the House and Senate, but it really takes this step of you all getting it on their radar screen. And that may you say, that's just overwhelming. I, I, can't, I can't do that. One person doesn't make a difference. Those two people, you know, you'll hear me, Charlotte Wright was the, was the CIO in Anderson County. Uh, Marina Horn was the same position in Pike County. These are two different periods of time. And, uh, you know, I, I credit those two to making sure that happened, that we got a, a budget increase, which, uh, you know, disappointingly has been cut, you know, since that time. But imagine where we'd be with if they had not done that. We need we need you to do that. We need it. Um, and you can talk about, you know, separately in your regions, how do you go about doing that? But But as I present it, if we get that raise, you know, that raise that restore the cut, not necessarily restore the cut, it goes toward the offers that help you fund your positions, help you replace the technology, and also helps us sustain that bandwidth in the future. Because we all know when that when that CARES money runs out and we don't have that raised, guess what starts getting impacted? The CATS offers. There's nothing else to take that from. To to have these cuts right now, you're not feeling it. But you know, there's there's certain things I know what how this plays out in one or two years, and this is the time to get it stabilized again. But it's going to take your voices to do that. And so you know, I'm I'm taking a look at it, and if you could you know bring that up for everyone that can see it, they can't see it. I'm just looking at it here. Is I really you know when you say you can and you will, that that you know if you if you if you talk to Charlotte you know uh, right. Um, and you talk to Marita Horn, that wasn't a one-time thing. I mean, they worked on it, worked on it, and eventually. 
when it got to legislative attention, then they said, you know, you know, you can talk to David Couch or someone. He can, you know, he can give you more supporting information from a statewide perspective. Because what they were saying, this doesn't just impact me. It impacts every district across the state, which this does. Uh, we know the importance of that. So is there anything else I, I you know, I left out in that uh, um, description? Uh, no, David, I don't think so. Thank you. David, that was an awesome I mean, it really for me is like a, a pregame, you know, kind of <laughs> charge. And and that our game here, or the, you know, the what we're talking about is over the next five to six weeks, right? So it's the it's the push over the next five to six weeks. And as you spoke, um, responses continue to come in, and it's awesome that we're you know right now, ninety six percent of folks who've have gave, given feedback through Go Soapbox is yeah. is accepting that charge. David, I think the one thing that uh, probably needs to be understood is if anybody goes to look for it in House Bill 285, which is the governor's proposal, um, it's not a specific line item. So it is, you know, lumped into the allocation for uh, our office. So they're not going to see KETS funding if they go search for it. So that might be one thing they need to consider when they have those discussions with legislators. But it is, in the, it is in the governor's office press release where it yes. specifically identified yes. it. So we're saying, well, where did you get it from then? Well, they specifically identified you know, that, mm -hmm. that amount of money for that. Yeah. Obviously, we would like the full 5.3 to be restored, uh, 4.6. Um, so, you know, when, when folks turn in the data, you know, your digital readiness and the TARS is, and, and when I talk about the, the achievements we've had over a period of 20 years, the reason I do that, it gives confidence in legislators we're a good investment. Look what we've done over the course of time. Look, you know, we've not squandered anything. There's not been a major, major issue with the money during all this time with the billions. When you take a look at cats over the course of time, billions have been spent, you know, since 1992. And I don't think there's one instant we show we were not good stewards of taxpayer money. You know, in fact, we, we maximized that investment. So we talk about the digital readiness. You're saying, well, why do, you, you know, why do you spend time talking about this stuff that you did 20 years ago, 25 years ago, or five, five years ago? Well, it shows we're a good investment. Here are, the, here are the products and services we put out that have been Grand Slam home runs that have served us well, just not then, but 25 to 30 years later. And by the way, here's the current snapshot of our state. You know, Marty's going to talk about the feed, you know, when we get your all's feedback every year uh, for digital readiness, plus the bright bites, this is what we use with the legislature. I mean, this is what we do. It. I mean, this is the, these are the times that go, well, show me it. And, and you're going to share it with you, too, when you go, if you speak to them and say, this just doesn't impact me. This is the difference. This makes a cross or state. Here are the things we've done over the course of time. We're a good, we're a good bet. We're a good investment. We've been great stewards of it. And if anything, during the pandemic, you know, it showed the importance of this. And it's not going away. There's a great stickiness factor to this. And so... Once again, I'm asking, there's very few times I say, I need your help. I need your help. I need it. We've carried it so far. I need you to carry it, carry your part of it, to get it on their attention. This is the time. You don't have to have a perfect scenario, but, but we need your help in getting this, because if it's not done now, we wait for two years, then we're in total crisis mode, and we've already sent degradation. So I know you're all happy with the current offers, and Thankfully, we found a way to do it, but I know that cannot be sustained because of these of these other these other funds that we have here. So, uh, once again, we you know brought you to the family table and laid out all the you know all the finances, and we try to do that in a very you know open and transparent way. Um, it's got to come from somewhere, and so we've reached that time. Uh, this is the time, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll you know I'll stop on that. But I really hope you all individually and collectively and talk about it, I've laid out the three. Increase the kits offer for your staff, for replacement of technology in your district when all this money runs out, which you all talked about in your feedback and concern, and help us not have to ratchet down the bandwidth, because the choice we will have in two years is either we reduce the kits offer to pay for these increases in bandwidth, or we start ratcheting it back down. That's the two choices we have. Those, those are not good choices. So, you know, everything's good, you know, right now, for two years, but do you really want to wait for it to get to this crisis mode and this really bad mode before you know people start screaming? This is the time. This is the time. All right, I'll pause there. Um, 
Is there anything that came up in Go Soapbox I need to see in, in questions um, um, or any, any other comments, maybe that before we need to move on to our next topic? No other comments yet. Okay. Uh, Marty, can you take us through some, you know, highlights of the uh, uh, the infographic? Now, I can't remember, did we share parts of that before? Is this the very first time we, we've shared it? So we have we have shared uh, parts, David, in a sense of uh, sharing our digital readiness uh, responses. And so, as you mentioned, um, a, a lot of this work comes from our digital readiness. Um, but but we wanted to go through our infographic, um, you know, not only it, especially as you mentioned just a, a few minutes ago. And I, and I love how you put uh, and I believe wholeheartedly that we are a great investment. Right. And we are great stewards of taxpayer dollars. And so we started this work. Um, and as you can see uh, the screen, I'm, I'm showing our Kets master plan. You put, David, you put this hyperlink in the email that you sent out today. There's yep. two great ways to get to the infographic. One is inside of our Kets master plan. And so if you just do a, a browser search for Kets master plan, the first link you come up to, um, you will come to our Kets master plan. And the infographic is embedded inside of what we refer to as surveys and results. And so um, that's the first way. And then the other way is inside of our um, digital readiness report, which also, again, in a browser search, if you type Kentucky digital readiness, um, it'll be the first uh, link that pops up and it's under reports. OK, so that's just a quick run through. But David, I think the big deal for us, um, we are a great investment um, as partners with all of our school district uh, leaders and ed tech leaders and and uh, and at the Kentucky Department of Ed and our Office of Education Technology working together uh, seamlessly to, to move things forward. This is our eighth um, uh, anniversary of the infographic, David. I'm not sure if you realize it's been that Ooh, long. Any balloons I, going I know. Up they're, they're, oh, yeah, they're, they're just celebrating. Yesterday. You didn't like yesterday we birthed that, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, it was uh, in 2015 at this very time, we, we asked this big question of the report that we wrote up um, from our digital readiness uh, survey and collection throughout the years. Um, it was a multi-page report. So we asked the question of how many of our decision makers were reading it. Um, and so we wanted to try something new because we couldn't answer that. Um, and, and we wanted to tell a story with the data um, in a visual way that started a good conversation and had folks ask questions and and so the infographic um was was born and again this is the eighth year and i want a quick shout out to gary bachman on our team he actually is on phil coleman's team who his creative genius launched the very first one and this is the first year that we are transitioning to a partner um, in bright bites actually producing the infographic. Um, so Gary, um, his, his genius uh, got us to where we needed to be for the last seven years. And uh, for our eighth birthday of the infographic, um, a, a partner is now um, pulling it all together for us. Um, so just to point out, we, we definitely tell a story about um, all of our K-12 digital readiness. We tell the story about the environment, the experience that kids have. Uh, we dive in on exactly what kids are getting to do with the technologies at their fingertips, um, what our teachers and our leaders believe in, um, and to wrap around all of our digital readiness, and then all the way through uh, education technology trends that we're seeing in Kentucky. And so just to call out, um, David, you actually all have already mentioned um, a lot of, you know, highlighted points about digital access, um, where 98 percent of our kids have access beyond the school campus, 95 percent have access at home uh, as reported. We, we talk about how this is a ratio, but it's 0.67 now, which is down 0.11 um, from the previous year uh, for students who have access to devices. Now, we know there's a lot of questions or, or, or a lot of design elements that uh, call into play, but we know the the our pandemic response in order to um, really get at remote learning um, in in important ways drove as drove a lot of the uh, progression over the last year, David. So um, call out that we have an increase over the last 24 months of uh, of 69 percent increase in Internet access, which goes to your point, David, about, um, you know, with one time monies helping get get us where we need to, um, we, we've got to continue to push so that we can sustain that continued growth um, with an uptime of, uptime of 99.98, uh, which is awesome. 
again, 100% of our uh, schools and district offices are connected with uh, the most reliable high speed quality fiber, um, which is great. We have over 1 million, uh, 38,000 student and staff computing devices at this point. Um, and then, you know, trying to get at the the designs, the, the instructional designs, the implementation strategies of, you know, districts who are shifting from maybe a BYOD strategy to now offer, you know, handing devices directly to kids. And that's, you know, whether that's K through 12 um, or that's, you know, 6 through 12 or 9 through 12 strategies. And right now we've just seen massive growth there um, with only 3% of our districts who've yet to really land on an implementation strategy, um, which is just unbelievable uh, growth. Um, when we get to what we refer to as the story around our students, which is the center of everything we're trying to do, st our students are, are the end game, what, what our students are getting to do. Um, so we, these are our digitally empowered learners and wrapping around, and you'll notice that in this year's infographic, it's, it's really tied to our Kentucky Academic Standards for Technology um, as the core themes are digital communicator, digital designer, digital collaborator. And we see some just awesome feedback um, from students. And this is a lot of our Bright Bites uh, modern learning survey work. 86% um, of students are asked to collaborate using online uh, documents, which is awesome. You know, we believe that definition of collaboration is that, you know, you're not really collaborating unless you're making something together. And, and that's just a huge piece for us, especially tied to our academic standards. Um, so 51% of students in Kentucky utilize technology to engage experts outside of the classroom. That might seem like a, a a low percentage, but to um, connect and engage with folks outside of the classroom is really that next step as a digital collaborator, digital designer, um, and digital communicator. Certainly digital citizenship, David, is it continues to be an emphasis for us and is a strong message from Kentucky. Um, where we would go as far as to say, you know, across the country, our our understanding and grips around why being a awesome digital citizen uh, for our kids and for our teachers, um, which also, uh, you know, lean into our families um, and communities, uh, why that's extremely important as we move forward, as, as our students are touching and are hyper-connected to everything digital. So 88% of our students say that their teachers talk with them about how to um, be respectful and responsible while online. That's, that's awesome. That's a huge number for us. 95% of our districts now have a strategic plan uh, for implementing digital citizenship skills. Um, and I love this, this because this is a this this data element here, this metric of the percentage of students who uh, are easily able to find out if online content is trustworthy. So asking that question of, yeah, I see this online or I read this bit of information, but is it true? Is it a fact? Is it trustworthy? That's just a next level um, question that our students need to be able to ask as there's so much misinformation uh, online and 78% of our students say that it's easy uh, to do that. So, th so they're quickly able to ask that next question of, well, is that is that trustworthy or not? And I think that's, I think that's awesome. So I want to call out our STLP growth, um, especially through the pandemic where we've had to reinvent. And Jeff Sobolski's done such a amazing job of reinventing at every step uh, how to continue the the growth of stlp i want to call out that this is something that we shot for um, several years ago uh, that we wanted more of our stlp implementations across the state to be uh, integrated into content and so now 70 percent of our programs are integrated into content and we still we still have 30 percent that are really focused on after school programs and clubs which is which is great and we want to shift that we want to continue to shift that uh, more so our, our stlp footprint is 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 amazing um, now we get into the storyline with our teachers and and we know that the people side as you just mentioned david is is exactly the right focus for us. It's been the right focus over the last several years. And now is the time to mention that we're planning to uh, modernize uh, the people side uh, study that we launched five years ago. We've got some work starting to take place to modernize that. And it's putting more emphasis, again, doubling down 
the emphasis on the people side. And so our digital learning designers, these are our teachers that 84% create and utilize instructional videos, discussion boards, uh, online uh, curricula and virtual classroom types of experiences. 85% use uh, online curriculum, 89% create digital resources. Um, being a creator as a digital learning designer is important. And then 68% use a learning management system, which is fascinating growth for us because we know that a learning management system is a key component of structuring learning in a way that makes sense um, for kids, uh, especially connected digitally. Um, I know I know my students today um, are uh, remote learners today. Um, our di you know our district is uh, canceled for in-person learning due to weather and and they're leveraging their learning management system and and so we see that number continuing to to drive up. Um, so I want to, you know, looking at how our teachers are connected uh, with our parents and families is important to us. Uh, that's this is this has been huge before the pandemic, pre-pandemic, through pandemic, and all the way moving forward is, um, you know, how we're connecting and and still email continues to be as you know reported back by teachers reported to be a still strong component, but they're all, we're also having more synchronous connections between parents and teachers, which is awesome. Um, and then still phone and text still plays a major role to, uh, for us. We're still cited as um, a top three state in, uh, from the data quality campaign. Um, and that's important to us as we move forward. Dave, you just mentioned the, the value of the people side of having someone that is overall leveraging and pushing for uh, data quality and, and using data to uh, to make stronger decisions. And then finally, as a digital learning collaborator, um, 83, I love this uh, metric, 83% uh, frequently collaborate with other teachers to design learning experiences using technology. That number is just huge for us. The more teachers we can stay connected and get connected, then the stronger we're going to be. Um, just as a, you know, from a people side perspective, when we think about empowering our teachers um, our leaders are are giving feedback that our school leaders that um, they feel strongly that they encourage teachers to try new things with technology and 96 percent uh, that was 99 percent of school leaders but 96 percent of school building leaders report regular discussing technology during teacher evaluations and walkthroughs and um, so those are deeper conversations about the uses of technology again we're not in the business or in the game of just using technologies for technology's sake. It's about the value um, and maximizing the effective uses of technology for learning's sake. And that's so that's you know really important for us. We know that our digital learning coaches are just driving a lot of this work across the state. Um, they can't do that um, and, and unless the technology works. And so it takes a huge team approach. Um, we know that. Uh, we have full-time and part-time digital learning coaches, and we see that shifting quite a bit um, over the, the last couple of years, and we see that shifting uh, as we move forward. And we also have library media leaders who are playing a, a key role, 60% report intentional collaboration and support of digital strategies for teaching and learning, which is, which is a huge uh, trend up for us. David, we've used this before, um, but just to call out again that mobile is where it's at in the learning space for us. And um, we now have 857,000, um, uh, almost 858,000 mobile devices. And that's just extremely valuable from a teacher and student learning perspective. Um, it's the any, anywhere, anytime, always on uh, aspect of learning. And, and Kentucky is sitting extremely well. Um, and, and we're actually uh, capturing this in a much smarter way now, a more accurate way. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Which leads to 94% of our um, of our district report students taking online virtual remote courses. Um, 45 districts offer online and uh, virtual or remote courses to students in other districts, which is a huge growth point. 95% of districts sponsor a learning management system. Um, we know that when there's a learning management system sponsored and adopted, that um, you can move uh, uh, that instructional design further faster. We've talked about this and we'll just touch on uh, the 
uh, again, this is a technology trend for us, an education technology trend, the digital footprint across the state. And, and this is continuing to grow. And if you look at the last eight years of digital readiness, you'll see this growth um, and this transition that you as school district leaders are making. And we're trying to stay lockstep with you all along the way. Um, and then finally, David, you mentioned this, but we do uh, include this in our digital readiness infographic, which is the stability of the CATS offers. We know that um, because we are such a great investment and we're great stewards of taxpayer dollars, we know that if we continue to step up and, and, and take the challenge that, David, that you just laid out, that we can keep that stable or, or increase back. You know, we get we get those. Um, we, we get that fully restored money back. Um, we know that if we don't, then we're going to see this dip. And I just, it's a call out back to 13, 14. Those were, those were tough years, right? Because we had some major cuts and um, we, we had to, our digital readiness took a hit, um, a direct correlation. Uh, and so we want to, we always include this in the infographic. The sources that we use, it's always important to cite our sources and, and uh, that's, that's valuable to us. But this is the infographic and take a, uh, take an opportunity to explore it. Um, it is a an awesome conversation starter. Um, and and if you can get a decision maker to ask a question based on something in that infographic, then it, it just it snowballs into a great conversation. Thank you, Mario. Thanks for all the, the folks that went into it, and, that, and obviously that's districts um, that provided that information. Um, or we had some other way to empirically get it. You know, like the. Four billion attempted cyber attacks. We we gather that through through another resource where we can see. And by the way, that's on a very low side. That's a that, that's a very conservative number uh, when you're getting four billion attempted cyber attacks. So uh, we have a way to measure those where we can see where uh, you know folks tended to do that. But, and David, I, we we refer to it as you know multiple data points. The the real story. I I. I I want to mention, I wanted to close with um, Ben Maynard on our team led all of this work um, to really get the infographic uh, going for the last couple of years now. And it just does an awesome yeah. uh, job. So just a huge high five. And, it, and he works with so many districts. Um, so when you see Ben, high five on this work. And I saw Ben, um, you know, recognized by folks in their feedback. Uh, so so this is information that you can use if you're a Bright Bites district. Obviously, you can take it, you know, you can really personalize that. We also sent the link uh, to the digital readiness, which, you know, when anyone does an open records request, you know, I, I point people to that a lot. And that helps you from getting an open records request, by the way, uh, because other states, when they their state level gets that, they point them to the district. And so that that researcher or that, you know, media, whatever, sends that open records request to you. Well, you, 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 there's a very high percentage of open records requests that have been avoided your time having to be spent because it's there, but also allows you to compare your district to, to, to others. Um, and we know people have, have used that to actually get, you know, increased funding as well, what we know within their district or increased positions. Uh, I know folks have used that to get, uh, you know, more technicians in their district because they could really see what the average was across the state. So we're trying to give you a toolbox, uh, trying to help you help yourself, but also help the entire entire state. So thank you, um, you know, thank you, Marty, for that. You know, speaking as you know of folks helping the entire state, um, is I want to give a, you know a shout out for Jefferson County and Fayette County Schools. Um, if you look back 30 years and having been there, you know, here that long and seeing what districts were paying. So this is before we had state contracts um, and state product standards. You could see firsthand because I, I could, you know, I could see where districts were paying for things when I first arrived. Um, and it was an enormous amount, especially if you compare in comparison, um, if you're a rural site uh, and you weren't wealthy district, uh, you paid um, far more than your fair share. Um, what Ketz has done and did in 1992, we saw the, the, the plus side just far from 100 percent perfect in the state contracts and product standards. We we have, but overall it's a double thumbs up um, in what it's done. But I want to I want to give a shout out to to Jefferson County and Fayette County because through the years they could easily throw in a fit and going, hey, listen, because of our size and the amount of money we have, we don't want to follow any of that. And it's true, they could drive down costs significantly for those two districts. And the other the other 169 
would be negatively impacted by that. The nice part about any one of our KETS RFPs that we have, if any district, now Jefferson County and Fayette County are the most common ones that drive it down, but if any district is able to get the vendor to lower their cost, it benefits every other district around the state. So there's nothing that prohibits a district from getting in time to business, I want to lower cost. Um, because if you're able to convince that district, that, that vendor to do that, by the way, that becomes a new price across the state, which obviously the vendor kind of keeps that in mind. But I do want to, through the course of time, and all the people that have been in the roles of CIO and ed tech leader in our largest districts, and I just, you know, there's, there's, there's some other ones, so Pike County, the Christian counties that are out there, the Hardin counties, uh, the really large ones, don't, don't be offended if I, if I didn't get you in the top five or 10 as far as size of a district. But you have truly helped the rest of this state. Um, and you, you could have thrown a fit, say, you know what, I want to break away, I want to be separate, I want to drive down my own costs. We did a financial analysis of that, and that would have cost our state, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, it would cost you all for the, in the, in the, the, the smaller and the rural districts a significant amount of money, I guess over the course of time in 30 years, probably getting close to a billion dollars now. So I do want to recognize those districts. They never in my time um, have, you know, thrown a fit about that. But at the same time, I've not publicly acknowledged them, not that they asked for it. So uh, Bob Moore and Kermit Belcher did not ask for this. So, uh, but thank you uh, to those to those districts that are doing that and helping driving down the cost significantly during the year. And it's, it goes back to that that theme of, We've been excellent stewards of taxpayer money. Um, and if you take a look at the other 40 United States, there's no one that's done this like this to try to drive down costs, to try to maximize costs, to try to give equity. And like I say, we're not, we're not perfect. I don't pretend to be. But if you talk to the vendors, even themselves, they wish the other 40 United States would follow a model uh, like Kentucky has done. So as you're talking with your legislators, we're trying to give you a toolbox of we are a good investment. We have been excellent stewards of money and it directly impacts you and every other district if you're able to get uh, you know, the, 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 the cuts restored or at least stored that we saw in the, in the governor's office proposal, at least to that, to that level. Um, uh, Mike, you wanted to hit on some things. I know you sent out a note. Uh, I, I saw the email that went out to all districts, so I don't know if you need to spend the time on it that you normally would have, but uh, covering you know, a lot of the items we have here, but I wanted to give you some time to hit the highlights of something you want the things you wanted to cover. Yeah, I uh, I did send a note out last week from the catch corner, my new little my little my new little buzz phrase there of sending something from the catch corner. Uh, but, uh, but but there was a sense of a sense of urgency for some awareness and reminders on some things. So I did go ahead and send that note out. I'll just really quickly run through here uh, and and hit on some of these things. The first one was technology planning. That tool is now open and active, and there'll be a lot of interaction uh, from our field staff. Um, and our uh, digital learning uh, co team coaches out there uh, interacting with the districts on uh, technology planning. Uh, definitely an important function that everybody needs to engage in. A lot of times that is an opportunity to be a part of uh, discussions going on with overall planning for the district, and, and it is uh, something that's required to be done as well. Uh, those are to be submitted by April the 15th. And, and one of the things I did want to note, it was brought up to me to make sure to clarify for folks, even if you're doing a multi-year plan, you do need to submit an update for that. And we put some notes in there about to how to do that. And again, your, your field, your uh, CATS engineer and digital learning uh, team contacts will, will provide you some additional guidance on, on that. Um, E-rate activity, um, obviously in, in full motion. Uh, the window uh, set to close uh, Tuesday, March the 22nd. Um, so that will quickly approach. Uh, it's a, it was actually a little uh, tighter window than I anticipated it being this year. Um, I don't know if something will happen that will expand that or not. Certainly right now we're counting on that not being the case. So uh, everybody has to be on top of all the different activities associated with E-rate and being prepared to file their applications. If you have 470s that you have to do, if you have mini bids that you have to do, uh, you have to have, you know, get those in motion quickly. Uh, there was three items that we asked for districts to respond to us for uh, to help us do the things we do at the state level uh, for E-rate. One was an updated letter of agency, which allows us to recognize districts as operating as part of the consortium for the things that we do on behalf of all districts. The uh, discount data information that we require and then the FCC 479, which 
uh, acknowledges uh, the compliance with the Children's Internet Internet Protection Act. Um, so we had a due date of those last Friday. I think we got really close to that being 100 percent. I know I was really on folks because we have some time time sensitive activity at the state level we're doing on behalf of everybody. So if you're one if you're a straggler of the the one or two stragglers, and I know the only reason we ended up having those was just because there was some follow up needed. Uh, that that those will be taken care of today. Um, in, in your KE will certainly engage with you in doing that. And again, it it actually may be a hundred percent as of first thing this morning. Uh, it was really close to being that. So, um, let's see here. Technology leases. Uh, a conversation under. Uh, uh well let me let me back up a second here i want to make sure i didn't miss uh speaking to you all about uh doing your mini bids um so there were some questions about mini bids and i'll just go specifically speak to the networking mini bids that districts would need to do and i put a clarification in the memo that i'd sent out about you need to advertise those mini bids to each and every company that's listed and associated to our contracts that we have, the kits contracts we have, regardless of whether that we anticipate they are responding to E-rate eligible products and services or not. The contract holders, the manufacturers that hold those contracts are responsible for managing that pool of resellers that exist and determining who will respond to which ones or not respond and whether the manufacturer will respond or the resellers will respond. So, we're not in the position and I don't want the districts to be in the position to try to determine that. Um, now, obviously we're expecting our manufacturers to ensure that the preferred resellers of districts are responding because that's part of the reason we expanded that pool of, of eligible folks to do business with the districts was at the district's request. Um, but we're not managing who's responding, who's responding to quotes or not. The, re the manufacturers along with their resellers are doing that. So you, you want to be sure to provide that, notification to each and every company that's listed and then they they will determine who's the appropriate folks to respond to those those mini bids um, so back to technology leases um, you know we mentioned back in november that uh, you know we we're, we we're, we're going to really be more firm with how we handle uh, dealing with leases in a tight time frame and in a crunch around e-rate and at that point, we mentioned the fact that we would put in, basically put in place a moratorium. Um, you know, it takes on an average of four to six weeks for us to turn around leases, uh, technology leases. And that's typically because there's almost always some back and forth, some interaction that has to go back and forth between KDE and the district. And keep in mind at the KDE level, it's the Office of Education Technology, it's our legal office. Sometimes uh, our Office of Financial Management uh, is involved. And then it's the commissioner's office. And so you've got, you know, and those people aren't just sitting waiting on another lease to come in to look at. There's other activities going on. And I'm not making excuses in any way, but that's just the fact of the matter. I mean, you know, there are other things going on. And so we have to, we really have to, you know, know that there's a time frame that's required for us to turn these things around. And especially whenever, and if you got everything perfect, I mean, if everything's done, you've got all the supplemental material, you got all the T's crossed all the I's dotted, there's no things that have to be followed up on for clarification and whatnot, uh, which, you know, hardly ever occurs when you have a legal office that's reviewing something. And again, I'm not throwing them under the bus when I say that. It's just a fact of the matter um, that, uh, you know, there's almost always a little bit of interaction back and forth. Hopefully it's minimal. But anyways, four to six weeks is what we figure. So we set the moratorium of when we will not accept a lease uh, with the, the, and, re, and review it for the expectation of turning it around during the E-rate window, which again, currently is scheduled to end March 22nd. Uh, we set that date of March the 1st. So we want all technology leases that are gonna be submitted to be submitted by March the 1st. We commit to working those leases and working them through the system. Now that's only three weeks. I just said it takes an average of four to six weeks. So even by waiting until March the 1st, you're really cutting yourself short on the time that we typically th say it takes to turn around a technology lease and to go through all the hoops and the steps. So if you're waiting until March the 1st to submit it, I recommend that you make sure you got all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted, and you got all the supplemental material, and you make sure you're following the, you know, the guidelines as far as what all is needed in a technology lease. So again, we're wanting to, you know, for everybody's benefit, 
set some expectations that I think are all within our means to, you know, uh, work within and to make sure we're able to turn these around and nobody's having to work the 11th hour to try to deal with a technology lease. And, and we've dealt, we've done that many, many times. Um, and, and again, you know, we understand that there's things that happen, but, um, you know, there's also ways to make sure we're proactive and, and in front of this and on top of it. Um, the uh, mentioned the mini bids, the network contracts, uh, and again, obviously, my memo I sent out, I got a lot more detail with a lot of this stuff. I did really quickly mention if anybody is still continuing to use the KI3, the state contract for internet and uh, voice services, voice services is not applicable to E rate anymore, but if anybody's using it for their local wider network connections, if they're actually using that contract as the vehicle, I put a note in there about your requirement to still do your local 470 and, and in order to award that to the use of that contract. And again, I think there's only a handful, and I'm not even sure that there's enough to count on one hand uh, that's still using that for local uh, for local uh, wider network services. I did also make everybody aware of a notice of proposed rulemaking from the FCC. The FCC issued, issued this on December the 16th, and that was to get feedback on uh, a change they're looking at making, and it all goes back into open and transparent uh, activity. And that is that when 470s are done, when competitive bids are done, that the actual responses to those four, what they're proposing is the actual responses to those competitive bids would also have to be posted on the E-rate portal. Um, so that has a lot of logistics associated to it about what does that mean and so forth. I mean, we're, I, I want to say I'm all in favor. We're all in favor of transparency, but I'm not in favor of things that create logistical challenges and problems and so forth. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, take a look at that. You can provide feedback directly yourself. There's 60 days from December the 16th. So I'm not sure that lines up exactly February 16th, but it's somewhere around there um, that uh, you're able to make those. We will make uh, so provide some kind of response on behalf of the state as a whole. So if you've got thoughts you want to share through your KE back to our team, we'll make sure to take those in consideration as we, provide a uh, response on behalf of the whole state. And then the last thing I had on my note uh, was the last mile internet reporting. And we originally had a due date of that of last Friday as well. There's been a lot of things that need to be clarified and cleaned up. So we have extended that date to the end of January. Um, we, you know, we have the ability to do that. There was no, there was no uh, absolute time certainty outside of our, uh, outside of our control. So we expanded that to January the 31st to do that continued cleanup and, and get that to information in place, so that reporting in place. So that was it, uh, David. Any questions? Any other comments on those items? Thank you, Mike. And uh, I know we talked about that a couple of times to get that those words out there. So if you've not read the note, Mike's uh, uh, covered the highlights of it. But I encourage you also to read that note. You sent out Friday. Was that Friday you sent out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sent it out yeah. Friday. Yeah. Um, if we could bring up the response to question three. Uh, do you share information from our monthly webcast and regional meetings, which, by the way, from your feedback, um, uh, and once again, those aren't 100% perfect, uh, this is not either, uh, this monthly webcast, but overall, you know, uh, districts give a thumb, double thumbs up to our attempt to try to educate folks, and even when it's not an area that hits you, if, I, if, if it's another, even another part you don't interact with, we try to make you aware if it involves education, technology, in any kind of way. And we'd ask you to do the same thing because, uh, you know, from your responses, not everyone has the equivalent here at KD that someone uh, really goes out of the way recently or once a month in a webcast to educate them. So really, we count on you to make them aware of it because they may not be aware any other way. So we may be hitting on topics. You may have nothing to do with Munis. You may have nothing to do with Infinite Campus or very little in your role. But there's someone else in your district, maybe the DPP and finance office that does. We count you to share that. Even, even you, know, you know, we hit a lot of educational, instructional, instructional technology related types of things. And that may not be you that hits up on that or, or much at all, but sharing that with the chief academic officer. So we hope that you, you do that. We do the summary notes that we write up at the end of every uh, webcast that we do, you know, in the format that we hope that you read through them. And I send those out, you know, with the agenda. Uh, so you, you can skim through those. So those are the highlights and reinforce it. Uh, if you even if you have watched it, but do a you know cut and paste and form the right folks in your district. So this is this is encouraging because we you know never really know if you, you do or don't. 
Uh, that's encouraging that that you uh, uh, that high percentage almost always do, um, and or occasionally um, do that. So appreciate that. Appreciate that uh, feedback. Uh, Didi, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to uh, uh, cover some of the items in your area before I hit hit upon the uh, uh, remaining time we have with the, the feedback. And just before you do, just so you know, for the feedback that you got, my intention is to hit up on that as I have all during the webcast, but spend part of a webcast on that. So today I'll spend a little time on it. Next month I will, obviously in March, but also we use those to help uh, make up our CIO Summit, which by the way got I don't remember a year at getting you know higher double thumbs up than we than we did with the virtual piece. All we all know we like to do the uh, the in person, but I, that 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 surprised me how much that was up in the, the thumbs up. But Didi, I wanted you to give you a chance before we got into that uh, for for the data side of things. Okay, uh, thanks, David. Uh, just a few things as reminders. Um, this is a civil rights data collection uh, year. Next year will be one also, and you may be that point of contact, but you may not be, and it speaks to kind of David's point previously uh, about, you know, making sure this information gets to the right folks. We do try multiple avenues. Uh, we had training with the uh, cases points of contact on Friday, the Infinite Campus group. Um, and so we just want to let you know, too, that there's two things going on with civil rights data collection. First, the, the collection window is open. KDE has populated all the data that we can, and it's up to the districts to validate that data and certify by the end of February. The second thing with the civil rights data collection is it is uh, there are a uh, comment window open right now for some additional collections they'd like to add to that. Um, you know, whoever your contact is should take a look at that. Uh, some of these items, they go so far as want us to start collecting this year. If we don't have a collection mechanism for it, it's probably a really good opportunity to say, hey, you know, this might be a good collection, but we need time to be able to create a data source for it. Um, the more comments they get like that, the better chance they are of at least delaying a new collection. So do uh, make sure somebody in your district has taken a look at that. Um, based on the questions that we uh, asked today, it looks like uh, a good percentage of you know that your work is in progress or uh, there's a few of you that have actually completed it. Good job. Uh, and then there's just as many of you probably that don't know whether the, um, you know, what the status of it is. So please um, keep that in mind as you as you, you know, share this information that uh, the point of contact within your district should have been set by your superintendent and uh, designated who's responsible for that collection and that certification by the end of next month. Um, another question I had brought up uh, in the um, in soapbox, and the reason for it is, is um, we rely very heavily on the WAPOX and the districts to um, populate their contacts, and I know we had some training last week that was very specific to um, counselors. Not a, not a group we normally communicate a lot with, but we went through the data steward, made sure that we were good to communicate with high school counselors, that the training was applicable for college going. We had both somebody from a university and somebody from uh, high school participating with that, and we felt it was really good information and applicable. When we sent that message out to uh, counselors, over 20% of those messages kicked back uh, as the email was invalid, the person was no longer with the, um, the school or whatever. And that was just something that we wanted, you know, to let you know that that data is used not just by Office of Education Technology, but by others. So making sure that you have the right contact people is just good because as people look for who to contact in your district, they can easily find that information in open house. But it's also good when we're trying to get messaging out to get the right people involved. So. If you, um, based on what we're seeing, um, there's you know, a few of you that do have the schools monitoring that. It may take a reminder every now and then if anybody's moved to let you know. We're also going to be communicating that with the case, uh, the Infinite Campus points of contact and counselors about the same message that, you know, we had so many kickback to take a look and make sure the names are correct. So you may get some requests uh, from one of those channels. We've not sent that out yet, but we plan to do it soon. So there's still time to take a miss. But many of you just have your districts are just too big for one person or a couple people to try to monitor comings and goings. So, you know, I think sometimes the best practice might be is having somebody at the district that gets that reminder at school level. It gets that reminder periodically to take a look at the school to make sure the contacts there are correct as well as the district con contacts. So just so you know, just a friendly reminder on that, just to make sure that the people in your schools and districts are getting the information that they need. 
we have had some questions that have come up, and I'm going to ask Phil to pop, maybe pop on because he can probably provide a little bit more detail. Some um, some sluggish issues and for the, between Infinite Campus uh, that appear to be a result of Lightspeed. Uh, we think that maybe this has been resolved with a new agent that Lightspeed's rolling out, and um, Phil might may have more information than I do. But as those um, agents get installed to the probably prioritized to the devices that are having problems, uh, that should resolve the issue. But we're going to be looking to you all provide feedback back to us to see if it does resolve the issue. We want to thank we've got three districts that have been kind of piloting this to see what uh, if it has taken care of things. So um, we do uh, have that going also. Uh, we do have, and the question that just came in the chat is exactly the next item I have, online registration. We do have an extension with online registration and campus learning for additional three years using ESSER funds. Uh, we did announce that to uh, district previously, but we were, you know, explained the same thing to the Infinite Campus Points of Contact Friday. So that is, uh, we are using ESSER funds for that period of time. Um, and uh, we'll be you know, having to align the um, campus learning to um, learning law. So we'll be working with you all to really be able to identify how that's making a difference in your district. So appreciate any feedback you'll be able to provide. We do have some upcoming training on online registration. So if you're using online registration and you want to take it to the next level, or if you're not used online registration, which there's still, still some districts that have not, and you'd like to start for this next school year knowing you'll have it for at least three more years. There'll be training in February that will be available to your contacts locally. So if you can want to put together a team and try to think about what more you'd like to do with online registration, this will be a great opportunity to hear directly from Infinite Campus and get some free training as well as some uh, guidance on taking those next steps. Uh, we do have um, the College Going Initiative. I've, I've mentioned this the last couple of, uh, of webcasts. We'll continue to mention the College Going Initiative and the emails that we're sending out or asking districts to send out through Campus Messenger to promote College Going. Uh, we've seen um, from the districts that have done that, and I will say it's a small number of districts that have done this. There's really been a lot of hits on that website, and CPE can definitely see uh, the impact from those districts that have done that messaging. So if you uh, have not already had your high school send that messaging out or your district's done it on behalf of your high schools, please uh, continue to promote that uh, College Going Initiative. And if you need more information, uh, please reach out to me. We've sent emails out previously, and I'll be glad to share information with you. Uh, so one of the things that we also want to just continue to stress is some upcoming training opportunities uh, with Infinite Campus. We've got some, um, like I mentioned, online registration, so February 22nd and 24th. We've also got uh, May, March 1st and 3rd through the 3rd is the Infinite Campus data days and master scheduling. Uh, for Kentucky, we do have a, a negotiated rate of $399 that covers anybody or as many people in your district and schools that want to attend to attend. So it's an opportunity for low cost training uh, to help as many districts. And you also have access to the recording trainings through that fee. So it's more long lasting than, than others. So we've got that coming up. So beyond that, David, those are my reminders pretty quick. Um, Phil's jumped on. So, Phil, do you have anything you would like to okay. add to the next piece? Okay. Let, let's do this because I was going to really have Phil talk about uh, the, a lot of things going on with Lightspeed okay. that we're doing to address it, um, just not that one. A common thing that came up in your, your all's feedback, and I believe it was during the, uh, the webcast we had in May and June, uh, particularly I think it was June, where we discussed all these new funding sources that became available that – um, we were able to, with an OET, justify to the different KD offices of using that percentage of CARES funds to fund. And we listed them pretty much in depth uh, in, our, in our summary of that write-up. I believe it was uh, June when we went over that. That was a pretty big, that was a big win for us. And did allow us to fund things like um, online registration from your feedback that also got tremendous double thumbs up on what we're doing, um, along with some campus learning uh, of, of what we were doing in those those areas, um, we're at a point to where we're we're, we're near uh, an hour and a half uh, into it. Um, so I'm I'm trying to balance, um, and I'll get give some of your thoughts on how to to handle it because I want to hit some of the feedback that we did not discuss um, uh, throughout throughout the webcast. Uh, before I do that, though, the, the most important part of today 
was about the budget, your role in trying to help uh, with that. So I saw one of the social questions, is there anything we should specifically ask for in the budget increase? And, and, and I would say be supportive of the, 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 the $4.6 million um, money in the governor's budget to restore the cuts to cats that will be used to increase the cats offers of assistance to districts to help them pay for staff, the people side, and to replace technology that goes off, but also uh, to help us pay for the bandwidth that we've upgrades that we've done when the money runs out, uh, which, which it will. So we're not having to ratchet down the offers of assistance. So those, those three things, the people side and the cats offer, the replacement or just the new stuff you have in your district, and the third part is for the bandwidth. That would make it that simple in that dollar amount. So I, I'll ask folks here. I can do it just on a, a special time to where I don't, you know, I, I could I could hold all this for the next month and just make it the first item where we talk about the feedback. But I, I think what I'll I'll do at least for some of the items that we didn't get to. For those that that have to leave, um, we'll we'll let you 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 take off at this time. For those that were uh, joining, just keep it keep it rolling for those that are watching it um, um, on, on the media portal, because there's certain items that we want to hit. And we want to talk a little bit about light speed fuel. You've sent out a note uh, that, that's associated with that. Uh, I want to hit on a, on a couple of highlights. And once again, my intention is over the next three uh, webcasts to do that. So for those that, that have to leave, I, we understand. Uh, I can just tell you some of the, the topics I'm going to hit upon uh, to say whether well, I'll be interested in, in staying or not is the A3 licenses for uh, Active Directory. Uh, just talking about the Active Directory upgrade itself. Um, Esports, um, uh, the Kentucky Virtual Library, I saw that in the notes a lot. Uh, some of the upgrades that we made uh, along the way. Uh, cybersecurity is an area that uh, done a hit upon um, uh, throughout this. And, and, and part of this hit upon, I want to get some of y'all's um, feedback on it, along with um, some of the goals I thought were interesting to mention that we've not done before uh, that I want to run by you. And this this actually may be a topic that we do uh, one of these for, us, for the summit. For, so, so for those that, uh, that uh, have joined us, once again, I apologize. It was my bad and, and I'm going to have enough, enough supervision around me in February to make sure the right two links, the link that we have in the calendar is set up with what I sent out in the meeting invite. Uh, so I'll make sure I do that. That's my bad. For those that joined us late and, and we had folks that were sending you over to this one, that's not your fault. That's my fault. So apologize for that, the confusion associated with that. So for those that can hang on, please, uh, please do. Um, it'll be a little bit less formalized. Uh, for those that can't understand um, and uh, hope you have a good uh, rest of the week. Uh, hope, hope you have once again had a good break and good run to go to, to 2020. So I'll start out uh, here with the first thing, and this is for our, our, our staff within OET, is the part that was most pleased someone in my position is the, the really positive feedback we got from districts about those, those folks on our OET staff that are customer facing to districts, uh, our, our, our engineers, you know, five star type of stuff. And we know they're far from 100% perfect, but I really appreciate our district spending the time to highlight their efforts because you know we do this but also they have we have the re they, they lead the regional meetings but also it's the day to day that we count on them and by the way Kentucky is the only state that that has folks that do that I never have understood I've tried to encourage my peers in the other 49 states I think it's a tremendous you know return for your investment of staying connected and in touch and best you can and definitely the KEs has been one of the grand slams and obviously we have a number of those former KEs on our staff and, and Chuck and Phil that are, you know, looking on and Mike and we you know, have some others, Marty, uh, obviously, and hit me over the head if I'm forgetting another, you know, super obvious one. What? Bob, Bob Hatch. Oh, yeah, that's right, Bob. Bob, the man of many hats. He's worn more hats than um, any of us. So it's a great testament to us, you know, our, our help desk, far from 100% perfect, but the, 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 the feedback we got from you all and it helps us because part of it is when you're looking at what you're spending money on, because obviously we have shared services that we're spending money on, it gives support for those are adding value to you. Um, and so that's that's really important, you know, to get that feedback that we have. Obviously, the digital learning team staff, our security team, um, you know, staff that we have out there, A-rate team, our infinite campus team. Um, 
anyone that's really customer facing. I and we're going to make sure those folks know and get that feedback. You know, they won't see it all, but they'll see the parts of it that thank them for their effort. And you're really, you know, good words. I think in any for any of us, for most of us, it just takes one kind word once in a while, and that that carries you for a long way. A uh, good number of people never get one word, you know. So that's why you kind of hear me during Mars appreciate your all's effort because one of the things I talked about we did in the past that wasn't stuff I did. It's stuff everybody had to do. In fact, I had very little to do with it. Uh, it was all that you all did, and even our staff did, to make it successful. So thank you. But I wanted our staff in this setting to let you know you got – really, it is appreciated, um, the services that you offer. And that's that's good for someone to hear in our position that really tries to outwardly do things that are customer-facing. And I would tell you, for those that have come to other states, there's no other state that does this, um, the kind of things that we do customer-facing – along with the kind of thing we do with the CO Summit. I don't understand it, um, but but not one. And the payoff is, is tremendous if we're all trying to go in the same direction. Once again, not 100% perfect and definitely don't do everything right or everything everybody wants to do, but uh, do our best with, with what, what we're given. Uh, so appreciate that, that, that feedback we had. Um, Bob, as you know, we've discussed a lot of things about cybersecurity. Um, about our, the, the really good things we've done with like cybersecurity defenses that we put in place. And this is a role that the state can play, and I'm sure you play it for your schools, is we can play the bad guy role. And sometimes we do that. You know, the password was an example of that, where you can say the state is requiring me to do that. Um, the state is requiring X, Y, and Z, even though internally you would really want that. And we know it. we try to do that balance of things you want and don't, don't want. Um, and what's needed to really make it work as a whole. Uh, but that is a good role, you know, things we've done cybersecurity wise. Uh, I did I did agree with the feedback we got is it we did a lot in the past 20 months. There was a lot going on. Um, a lot of these upgrades, a lot of major initiatives going on, a lot in your all's plate. And I think I think the districts for you know, these tiny staff in your districts and you know, hopefully the money that we can get this money restored and it can help you out. Uh, even yourself out um, is, uh, you know, you know, Bob knows right away. It's probably 10, 15 percent talking about cybersecurity related things that we have done uh, is overall a, a big, a big positive that we had in place and the staff that we have uh, in, in place to to help out with that. The Katie Web apps was also something that came up uh, of the of moving to a single sign on the infinite campus to SAML also, you know, listed as a double thumbs up. One of our greatest things that we did uh, during the during the course of the year, the AD project, Chuck and and you know hats off to to you and everyone involved. And I know we we wanted to wait till we got to the finish line before we sent out letter of thanks because it's it is one of those things that's gone incredibly well. And the feedback, which I know you've read as well, recognize that from from the district's perspective. Uh, that's how you do do projects, and you know a lot of the major ones that we have done over the course of 30 years, we have followed that. You know, and it, it's always interesting for someone to come from another state that they recognize that's that's far from the norm, and they think this is the way normal things are done. But grand slam, the way that's done. Every, you know, our vendor partners, our folks in districts, our folks in KD agency. Whenever I recognize success, it's not us. We know we play a major, you know, just a really small role in all that. Um, but an important role, small but important role. But I want to that that definitely got the highlights throughout that how that was done, and really everything associated with the Kinrack, Bill. And I know you've been involved with those as well. All the upgrades we've done over the course of time to all the different components in that Kinrack were very much appreciated. Um, and I know you read those um, and those comments uh, coming back uh, as well. Um, the um, once again, the state contract and the role that we we play with that um, is uh, the, the ones that we have in place. And, and appreciation, I think there was two ways in this. There was appreciation of the new networks components contract, but understanding the complexity that brings when you have that many primes and that many resellers. Uh, so I always say, be careful what you ask for. Um, is uh, when when you have when you when you have a certain amount. Uh, it is much more difficult to manage. We know that. And that's why typically companies, um, you go to major large companies, they have one computer vendor. They don't have, you know, you know, you know, three or four. They have one. 
Uh, we're not that, we know that, don't strive to be that, but that's that's why it is easier to, to get down to number, but you did enjoy the choices of that. And, and we could see that the stuff we've done in the firewall and the policies and the geo-blocking, Phil, uh, was definitely, you know, I could see that from the feedback. Chuck, the things you've talked about and Bob, we talked about this in our last webcast, about the things that we're doing uh, to increase our cybersecurity uh, with mm -hmm. our next phase, our Disney-like, our A3 licensing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, across the state, uh, was definitely something I could see that was uh, was was greatly appreciated um, and, and and needed. The um, the parts, Phil, I want you to hit upon, and you send this note out uh, about light speed. So this was an interesting part uh, for for me to read. It is during the pandemic, obviously, uh, we had to have something because the you know we went way beyond NTI's 10 days it was a uh, everybody's there you are buying tons of, of one-to-ones mobile devices um and, and and desktops are being you know more being you know quickly replaced and still are and that was already the trend uh, with mobile devices now they're going home and, you know and the really approach we had with that before there's nothing by federal or state law that requires uh internet content management at home but we know districts have to deal with the headaches of that um, and so it was nice how, how quickly and fast that we put together that initiative. And you can see that was that was recognized and applauded. The part that I could see from the feedback, Phil, and I know we brought that attention to Lightspeed, which is always helpful um, in, in this, is we, 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 we take this and we, you know, walk, talk. We can't make everybody 100 percent happy. I know you within your district, you can't make 100 percent percent people happy. We try our best to make the high, you know, as high as people percentage as we can, knowing that we're never going to reach 100 percent. But we've taken that with our vendor partners and because we have the leverage of the state and you all mentioned that in your plus side of us having statewide contracts, you know, for statewide product uh, standard, mm -hmm. we can put a leverage on these companies that no other state can because then they lose them all or a very you know, high percentage of them and, and we get their cooperation. It's a great leverage point, uh, and it, the, the pluses far away any any minuses of it. So, Phil, I know we've had, you know, we regularly talk about, you know, yeah. uh, you, know you know, two things in our uh, our, our uh, OET leadership team meeting, as you know, um, and uh, this is one of these recently that we've talked about that this is always where we at with addressing this one, um, and you know, part of it is what Didi was talking about with Infinite Campus. The, the, the one that stood out to me of the, the issues with it. And, and once again, when you're in, in these kind of positions and you're in them well, but when you're having a state level, as Phil, I think you're educated, we have 2,300 buildings. We have 1,532 schools in Kentucky K-12 public schools and, 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 and the 2,300 buildings is trying to figure out how, how big the problem is, the magnitude. And once again, I don't ignore it, even if it's a 1%, but it, it, you know, it's different if it's a 50% or 40% broke is, with infinite campus, it wasn't a hundred percent. It appeared to be the power users of it, but it didn't, it didn't deter us from addressing it because having folks using infinite campus is a very really important tool. And Didi knows that, as you know, from our OET uh, meetings of, of discussing this topic. Uh, the other one is making sure that the company was responsive in their help desk when folks are having uh, any kind of issues. The other one is reporting that they really thought they had the ability to do before that they felt they didn't have with the transition. And there probably is a few others in there. So Phil, I want you to spend some time talking about, we don't, I don't think we have, we're at hundred percent solving it, but we hear you, we're using the leverage of having a product standard with that provider um, uh, to try to have things addressed. We knew really from the, it sounded like it really wasn't a Chromebook issue. And you can see from our, 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 our percentages is, you know, we have, what was the percentage of Chromebooks out there? Just give me that. What is that? Is that 71%? I mean, that so that we have 16% uh, Windows, and then we have 2% um, that are Mac OS. Uh, but we did, you know, virtually no complaints from the Chromebook side. Uh, whatever that percentage was, I can't remember. Marty, if you're still on, what, whatever that percentage was, you just showed on there. Um, but it really would look, we heard the biggest complaint uh, from, from the Windows but the, the, the Mac OS, you know, that 2% there, the 16% in Windows, uh, was, was the issue where we were hearing it. And then uh, when they were using Infinite Campus. So, Phil, take us through, and I know, uh, you know, Chuck, you've been involved with it and along with that team, and, and our, our, our field staff is too. So tell us where we're currently at with addressing that. So uh, 
David, you you well know that we and you've talked about all the really neat things that we've done and, and we've put together over the years, and it's just so much fun, so so much fun for us to circle back on some of these very very big companies and, and vendor partners and try to make them do things better. So, uh, you know, when when Light Speed roll, rolled out initially uh, last year, when the Relay Project rolled out, that was just great timing. We had that ready to go when districts needed it absolutely the most. If you read the feedback, which I actually went back and read the feedback last year, and then I read the feedback this year, it seemed like lots and lots of frustration with the uh, the infrastructure move that we made. It's a different technology, and the analytics reporting that we kind of put on top of that. Uh, so, the, you know, the the big one, like like you said, was you know campus high, you know, kind of high power user. Uh, from from campus. Well, I'll be honest with you, last week didn't think they had any problems at all. And this kind of goes back to some of the fun that we have is trying to help some of these big, big districts, I mean, big, big um, vendors overcome us breaking their stuff. <laughs> we, we absolutely, we just absolutely floor their, their stuff, if, you know, whether it's AT&T, or whether it's Infinite Campus or whether it's Lightspeed. Microsoft, we've done it many times with Microsoft. When we scale, we just break stuff. And uh, it's just so much fun. You know, David and I get to be on the phone, a uh, couple of phone calls every week with, with some of these big vendor partners really putting a ton of pressure on them to make sure that they, uh, that they get this kind of right. So we are working with Lightspeed to go back and answer Dee Dee's question. Uh, she, she, you know, she talked about the infinite campus, and that really is a Windows issue, and not so much, or, or a Windows issue plus it's a relay uh, client issue. So it's really not the not because of Windows, it's because of the uh, the relay client. So that's going to be updated. We have three school districts that are uh, testing that right now for us, and it looks like that's a go. And then our next step would be to uh, to launch that and get that out and available to uh, to all of our school districts to be able to to do that. But we also work on some really, you know, some things like, um, you know, we have some firewalls that we, that we feel like are vulnerable. And, you know, when we have power outages, whether it's due to uh, weather or intentional or unintentional power outages, you know, some of the, sometimes these firewalls don't come back alive. And so we've got a, a, a very big effort with AT&T to get those uh, get those replaced. So that's, uh, that's something that's coming. But, you know, all the fun we've had, the funnest part, David, is circling back on these districts and just uh, addressing uh, our ability to to absolutely crush them. And we tell them that up front. I, know, I don't know how many times I've heard you say it. We, we tell them, you know, can you scale? David and I went to uh, Atlanta many years ago to meet with AT&T right before we launched our big frame relay projects. Most of you probably are not, not been around that, that long to know or remember what that was. But I remember David saying, can you scale? Can you scale? And they said, yes. Yeah, oh, we can scale. Look, man, we've got, we got more networks than anybody. So uh, what we found out was they had very, very difficult time scaling. And not just scaling to meet the initial demand, but to keep it up. So that's one of the reasons we're not on frame relay anymore. So we got to actually have a much better network. I would say this, Bill, when we talk with vendors, and you're right, it doesn't matter how large we are. Um, we are a Fortune 510 company. If you take a look at the size and scale and how much we stress them, and they, they frequently underestimate that. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the dynamic is when you have 170, 172 organizations, uh, what you want to have some independence there, but also working as a team together. Um, that is what, what really puts a stress on. And, and given that we are the nation's leader in cloud-based computing, I think they underestimate. I think really Kentuckians in general underestimate how much of a, K, a, of a cloud power we are in the United States mm -hmm. uh, compared to every other K-12 and every other state statewide and even to companies in that state. So we really, 
you know, put it on it. But there's some some dynamic when they say, well, we've done Dallas, we've done Philadelphia. I always tell them it's meaningless. Yep. Uh, you will not. That does not guarantee anywhere near success of uh, doing the state in our in our state. So it takes them a while to go. Oh, yeah, you're right. And then they they adjust. I always say this in our meetings, Phil, that you're talking about. And it's important. We just don't go in there screaming. And, and we have some of our vendor partners. I'm sure they're still on. They understand is now we're we're intense, but we're fair and respectful. Um, it is not one you go screaming, um, uh, you know, screaming at them at. Um, um, and so, you know, I think it's the um, I'm not, Jeff Sabolsky, going to throw in a, a Star Wars. Boba Fett is a, you know, a, a special that's, that's out for those that can watch that. And he he's just taken over. He says, I don't deal by 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 fear. I deal with respect. And so that's the way. So I think there's part of that is with our, our partners is where we're, we, we don't go in there with mutual respect. Uh, we know they're trying to do their best. Um, they they openly you know admit and don't don't push back too hard. Of yes, we fell on our face, uh, and and it, it, is, it is a constructive part. But they recognize. I can tell you, having the entire state as a leverage point helps us get from point A to B much faster. If every everybody was off on their own, uh, and and, the, and we saw that in the feedback where you recognize we use that leverage to help you all. Whereas if you were on your own, you would not have that leverage. Um, and we use that to your benefit on, on your behalf in these discussions um, yeah. uh, to, to make things better. So obviously we're having that discussion with uh, Lightspeed regularly and with one of our other partners pretty regularly. Uh, I mean, weekly. Um, well, I'm and, solving and, them, actually. And, so, yeah. We're trying to make, to make improvements in. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell this story. It happened to me this morning was I was sharing with my wife, I used to try to share my calendar, you know, so that she knows what I've got going on. And she goes, how can you guys be so busy with all this, the weather outages at schools and with COVID outages? How can you be so busy? And, you know, she's she's been around this for almost 30 years and I, I just have to give her a look and walk away. I, just, I don't understand why she doesn't understand that. So uh, I was like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. It makes no difference at all, you know, about, you know, COVID allergies. That just made, that just turned up the heat. Yeah. And uh, with with weather, that just turns up the heat. So, um, so we're here working and, you know, we're just uh, keep kind of trudging along and, and it's just busy, busy, busy. And, you know, some, a lot of times we spend, to David's point, we spend with our big providers, making sure that behind the scenes, they've got the stuff and the processes and the technology to make sure that they meet our needs. And we, we do look at the feedback and we, uh, and we certainly honor that. So I think the other thing that helps us is, um, uh, I have my peers in the other part of the four United States. And so, you know, we make the vendor partners aware if they're not cooperative or they just do something off on our state and leave, I will make sure the other four United States are aware of it, my equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, that's really, really helpful. And we have other states that have done statewide implementations, not many. They just can't pull it off. You know, Nevada, uh, you know, has infinite campus across the state. Uh, and there, these other states are trying to talk to us about how do you do that because of the big plus sides of that overall. And once you get it, um, you, you re really got it. Uh, so they're helpful uh, in this. And, and, and so we get we get leverage points, sometimes multiple states working on it. So we, we recognize infinite campus uh, being an issue, even if it's a, if it's a one percent, and it's just, it's just your power issue, power users, because it was at ninety nine percent broke. So we're trying to see where specific specific ones, Windows and the Mac OS, and then you know once again sixteen percent, two percent, and then out of that sixteen percent, two percent, what folks are really power user of Infinite Campus, and do you individually just deal with them? And do if there has to be an upgrade, you just deal with those folks individually, um, or do you have to do them all? Uh, the other part is getting the, their help desk services more responsive. I think that's a fair request, um, and I'm pretty sure we take this <laughs> your feedback. Uh, and I know we don't put the district's name on it, but we collectively take it and we show it to them. Um, and it really helps having this all in one spot. Uh, to, to put the leverage point and the heat on them uh, to, to address that, to say, you can see from that point of view, it's not, you're just not being responsive in this when they're in a, in a tough spot. The reporting is a fair thing. I think the part we all are trying to get granular, I, I also saw that where 
just just so you know kind of what's being used on your network and not. I you know as a, as a CEO of district, I'd want that. So we understand that the importance of that um, and the granularity of that uh, and the tools that you had not having that and that's important. I, we agree that's an important thing to to have back in place. So. Phil, is there anything beyond the note what we said we need to share on that topic before I go on to something else? Uh, no, I just, you know, with light speed, we're going to be gathering some of the district feedback and we're going to be actually sharing that with them this week and uh, be meeting with their leadership on uh, Friday to uh, to go over some of that. And and uh, we've been working on an, an improvement plan for the last month and a half, probably, or two months, but uh, we're, we're going to kind of start bringing that to a head and sharing that with school districts. So, good stuff. Let's talk about uh, the eSports part of it that was listed on there. And I, I agree that in, in um, most of you may not know is um, I'm KDE's, the Kentucky Department of Education's liaison with the High School Athletic Association. And so tomorrow there's a board meeting and I'll be you know part of that all day. I'm also the Department of Education's liaison with Kentucky Educational Television. I'm actually a board member on that. So I really do try to stay in touch and in sync with what those uh, two organizations are doing. Um, and the, the the part without esports, particularly, uh, I'm, I'm going to lay out to you what's, what even happens high school athletic associations. So they have an organization, uh, and, and it's a it's a you know private company that is marketing esports, you know, to these different high school athletic associations. Now, the downside of the way that company operates, and this is some high school athletic associations that they need to get a handle on, is they go out and they market certain games to school districts without, first of all, getting the high school athletic associations thumbs up, which is problematic. So they're getting districts excited about a game that has not been vetted by high school athletic association nor us. Uh, and for the, you know, the, the world of esports and our Kentucky K-12 uh, internet service, we are the playing field. Um, and so any kind of game that is intended to be played over the K-12 internet uh, playing field needs to be coordinated with us first. And obviously, we had a situation where a game was not done that way. Um, uh, the Nintendo Switch game, Smash Brothers, was not done that way. Um, and so the High School Athletic Association notes, and, and we're having a discussion with them. We have three topics I'll share with you we're going to talk with them about. The one is the step that it, that goes through with the company that's selling a portfolio of games is called Play VS. Is what is the leverage that High School Athletic Association has on them? To first of all, make sure they get the double thumbs up from them before they're marketing to Kentucky school districts and getting them excited. The second one is getting that to us to see if that game can or cannot be played. Uh, in particular, with the Nintendo Switch, it has really severe cybersecurity limitations from our perspective to work on. A, a, a network, an internet network of our size and scale that services 171 school districts. There are about 21, 22 school districts that play, that at least have one team uh, that play that game. But I would say this is, is even if that was an esports game, anything structurally administratively that required that many things to be turned off or compromised on a K-12 network, we would now let to them because it puts the entire network at risk. As, as we talked about earlier, four billion is not a a high number. It is actually a very conservative number. Of attempted cyber attacks that we that we've able to ward off, and we can see it in your comments of an appreciation of the cybersecurity defense that we have in place, and the recognition that the, the things that you hear in these other states about their cybersecurity attacks virtually never happen to Kentucky and successful ones. And I'm not out there trying to rev up and get a bunch of cybersecurity. Um, uh, attackers revved up and criminals revved up, but we do a good job with that, and we don't want to create a hole that is difficult to maintain. Because once you create those holes, then you guys always remember these one-offs. Uh, Any time you do something, so the the easier part to deal with games like that, if folks say they want to play, is when we ask that question. I believe it was in our November webcast for Nintendo Switch. Where do you play that game at? And the most common answer we got is a hotspot service. Except that's a separate field, a separate internet service uh, that beyond the K-12 network, and that allows the district to either play it right on the school campus or beyond the school campus if you get a hotspot. I think one of you talk, talked about playing at the library, but you can play it at a rec center, play them at a church. Uh, if, the, if the coach wants to have all the team together, obviously uh, that is a game that can be played individually at the home. 
but I, having been a youth coach of five different girls and boys sports over 20 years uh, and, and a team sport, I definitely understand the importance of having a team together as you practice and you play. Uh, but particularly with the Nintendo Switch and any game that runs off of that, um, and Bob knows that in our staff, is it has severe, it requires major things to be turned off at the statewide level that I that that if it was even if it wasn't esports, we would not allow that for instruction administrative. And by the way, there are thousands, tens of thousands of things that are running over that network, including the other sanctioned high school athletic association games, Madden's on there, uh, League of Legends, and uh, Rocket League. Uh, those are all run over the K-12 network. They run fine. Uh, now keep in mind the Nintendo Switch, as most esports have their roots and were, were begun. So to be sold and played at home. They're, they're, they're a customer market. I think Nintendo Switch <clears throat> for Smash Brothers, since it came out, has sold 25 million copies. You take whatever that is. 99.999% of that is for the home market. We would not expect, given a huge percent of the sales are for the home market, of those 25 million, that Nintendo Switch would make any kind of significant changes to their product line to run over a K-12 network. Uh, definitely one of our size and our scale as we talked about. So typically we ask vendors to do that. If you want to run on it, make your product work over our environment. But given their, their, their primary sales and it's a monstrous amount of that of those are for home, they're likely not to make it. So I would I would say, you know, for you is any time that you want to play those and we're going to have those discussed. High School Athletic Association is topic number one. What is the sequence they go through? because we don't want to put you in a bad spot. Some of you are esports coaches. So I think there's three or four of you that are esports coaches. Um, uh, the rest of you just, you know, you, you get this, you become the bad guy, the bad girl by saying no. And we're all placed in those bad roles. Um, those lingering roles are having to say no. It was part of being in these jobs. You can't say yes to everything. Uh, or it just creates a hole that you really don't have anything then. Um, any kind of standards, whether that be design or products that you just don't have any. So. Um, for that one, the, the recommendation we're going to give to those coaches up front, especially for the Nintendo Switch, if you really want to play that game, then you also got to buy the field to play, which is an internet hotspot, or go find a field to play. As a youth coach for many years, part of my job as a coach was regularly find a place for us to practice, and if the primary place we were going to play is not there, is to find a place to play. So that's part of the coach's deal. It's just not coaching strategy, but coaching, you know, to find a place to, to, to practice and play on a field of play to do that. So um, there was a monstrous amount of feedback on esports, but I wanted you aware of that step. We're also taking a look at the step. There's a lot of the components of high school play associates that's counting on the K-12 network. For example, uh, and this this makes sense to me, and, and for anything, and this is important, this is done after core instructional hours that we allow these things to be played. So anything that's not related to directly to instruction or day-to-day -day administration is after school hours or, or on a weekend at a certain time. And definitely sports falls in that um, in, in that category, but there we're, it, but there's other sports that fall in that as well. So broadcasting a basketball game or a football game, um, there are go fan and in, in the good percentage of districts, I don't know if it's 30 or 40 percent now have go fan. To where instead of actually using a paper ticket, use GoFan and, and everything everybody's got to have. I know going to the Woodford County football game this year, there was no paper. Because you had to do everything on a smartphone to get into the game. It was done through GoFan. Now, they're going through to do that is the district's Wi-Fi to do that, to set that up. We also have situations to where state championships are being played from a K-12 building. And so they're using both GoFan and something called Pixlot services to broadcast that game and to be a moneymaker uh, because people can't make it the grandparents you know my my kids when they played the grandparents lived far away um really would have been nice if they could have joined and lit and, and watched that but and they've been willing to pay to do that uh, but the same balance is high school budgets have to balance this issue of they got to get enough money to pay for this to pay for the sport and then there's some sports that pay for other sports Football, girls and boys basketball, the revenue gathered through those those three sports in particular typically fund all the other sports in the district. And so what they found is people coming to discounting on virtual brought in maybe 5% of the revenue because a lot of people go to sports events, and I hate the saying having played them. I thought everybody was paying close attention to them. 
is a social aspect of talking to folks. And now having been on the other side where I'm a fan is I go to the, the college games I go to, a lot of that's interacting with the people I'm around, whether it may be family or friends. And so if that's not available, I'm not necessarily going to pay for that to watch that sport. So from a revenue point of view, a very high percentage of organizations will want people to come in person because that's where they get the social interaction part of that, uh, that aspect. Uh, but so we got to work with High School Athletic Association on how does GoFan work uh, through a K-12 network and do they have a backup for that? Um, for some reason, the district's out or when they have a state championship, I believe, I believe volleyball and soccer is actually held at K-12 venues. Um, so how does that work? And we got to make sure we're not doing a network upgrade. So it's typically those events are on a Saturday and Sunday. As most of you all know in this, this business, is you do a lot of your upgrades during non-core instructional hours, uh, but then sports are played during those hours. So you got to try to balance when those things are done because you can't you can't not have any time for those. So we're going to have that discussion along with the third topic of students that are just 100% virtual in, in, in their attendance. Is how do how do they are, how are they what's the link between them playing uh, sports and particularly uh, I think this the part of the esports but just in sports in general. So those are the three topics. That were scheduled to discuss with them. The last item that I'll spend, I'll, I'll just give you a heads up about it. We'll spend more time next time. Out of all the feedback that I got from all the districts, the most surprising one to me was the Kentucky Virtual Library. Uh, the appreciating us using, and, and, and this was our office uh, getting approval to do that, along with other offices going along with here in KDE is using the portion of the CARES money to help pay for the Kentucky Virtual Library. That was surprising to me. Um, not because the Kentucky Virtual Library is a poor service, but that, that made it to your list. And part of it is, I'm trying to understand why it made it to your list. Now, is it from a financial port where it was taken from your budget and you're happy you're no longer having to pay for it out of your local ed tech budget, you can spend on other things? I can understand it from that perspective if that's the case. Or is it something else? And studying this over the course of time to give you a historical perspective, back in 2009, when our original big cut occurred to Kets, we took a $3 million cut, $3 million, huge cut. It was, it was close to 20% of our budget was cut. We had to make the, the, you know, some, some choices of some really bad choices. And at one time, uh, Kets paid for the Kentucky Virtual Library. When we took a, a $3 million hit, is we had to pick the things that we no longer paid for. And so most like anything, we take a look at the empirical data of how much people are using or not using something. I'm sure you do something internally within your district where you actually measure the use of a service. Uh, and if it's used by 5% of the people, it hurts to cut it. But if 95% are not, and, and you have another service they're using 80% of, well, that's a pretty easy call. Uh, that you have to make. Uh, it's a really bad and, and painful call. And, and the virtual library fell in that category of taking such a massive 20% cut. I think we paid around $300,000 per year. And I, I gave you the very beginning of how money works. We're not having money added on. And so, for example, someone says, we want you to always pay for your virtual library. So, well, does that mean you want your offer cut by that amount? So they say it costs $300,000 a year. Uh, we want you to start paying for that again. When this money runs out, well, that would mean that we would cut the offer of assistance by that equal amount to do that. And so we, you know, part of this taking a look, is that what you really want? Or is there another appropriate funding source to pay for that? Back in the 2009, 2010 timeframe, when this originally came up, we took a look through um, our MUNIS system that we can see, which is really nice. You know, Kentucky, the only one that has a state product standard for a financial management system. So we can really see what everybody's paying for everything. And so for library funding in particular, it was like $29 million annually. And this was 2010 timeframe is sent to districts to just buy library stuff. And what was spent on, I think it's what is actually spent, $29 million. The amount of money per district for Kentucky Virtual Library was around $1,300. If every district bought, I think it's $2,400 if everybody bought annually. But so a district, you break that down, I don't know if that's $70,000 that on average every district gets with just library types of funds. So there was a money source to pay for that. 
So we found about 100 districts were found another funding source to go down going payment. 70 did not uh, pay for it. The other big point of this, the, the contention is the Kentucky Virtual Library really did not have a way to show how, some, how much something was being used. Um, and even with the thing they did show it was being used, it was used by a very small percentage. And we really couldn't tell by a small percentage how much they were using it or not using it. But the districts that we were paying the virtual library for, we could see virtually nothing was being done with a very high percentage of them. Uh, and with the percentage that was used, there was no granular detail to tell, is it really beyond the librarian that's using it? Or is this three people using it? So I think that's still a challenge going forth with the virtual library, is having a way when the money runs out, and Marty, I have to remind me, I think this pays up to 2024, maybe 2023, the virtual library cost. But at some point, we'll be faced again with that not being paid for. Now, that has a lot of wonderful stuff in it. It was never, never, you know, the, the challenge of it's not wonderful stuff in it. It was just was not used uh, tremendously. So, Marty, you're going to add a comment there. Yeah, we have the uh, funding, David, um, to reimburse for two years. So that's this school year currently and next school year. Um, okay. the, the good the good part about the strategy, and I think a lot of the response in favor um, as a kind of a, a a nice, you know, good news item as given feedback by our CIOs, net tech leaders is, you know, the, the strategy was that it's purchased at the district level up front and, and then it, then we reimburse. And so getting that back in line item um, at the local level um, with those existing funding sources, likely not education technology funding sources, but just other instructional materials, instructional resources and other library funds. And um, it was, it was a good part of the strategy. And then we reimburse it um, from, using those ESSER funds. Yeah. So part of the, you know, the question I have for the, the districts that, that are on is it, what was the major driving force to have that show up so many times is you're glad that that was being paid for? Was it, you know, and, and, and nobody's going to have to say, because I saw specifically where one district said it was taken out of your, that district CIO's budget. So they were happy something else was paying for it. But once again, like anything, when I, like I go to a co-op meeting and a superintendent say something, my common technique is, uh, especially if they're fussing about something, I said, who else rate, who else has the same complaint? And a very high percent of the time is that it's that one, maybe one other person raised their hand, it's unique to them. So you can't tell by one's response. So is it you really saw the added value of that? It was wonderful. And it was, but we knew a really high percentage of districts were already paying for that. Uh, either, you know, this, as I mentioned, there's a huge amount of money, close to $30 million the districts are spending for library materials, and this would definitely fall in that category. So what led to that? Uh, you know, so you can put it in the chat, you can put it in the Go Soapbox. For those of you that put virtual library was one of our biggest hits of of, of uh, 20, the calendar year 2021, is can you give a little more explanation on why uh, it was such a big hit? But part of the reason I want to discuss it, it's got a lot of good materials in it. Mm -hmm. That was never the, that was never the, the problem. The problem is such a slow percentage of people were using it. And as Marty knows, and everyone's involved with it to know, is if we'll run into this again. If, if the virtual library does not come up a way to really show how many unique people are using it and what they're using it for, they run into the same issues over and over again of showing, they can show a number of people did this query and that query, and that, but they can't really show, was that just the librarian? Um, it's, David, it's, it's usage. We, always as always refer to it as usage and adoption and trying to understand that but also then you know quickly getting into the impact on you know is it helpful for kids and teachers and you know in the learning process bruce lindsay and and i know that there are local uh, regional conversations that have happened around this but you know the connection with kyvl and remote learning um, being hand in hand and then also that now that nearly all kids have a device and we just kind of talked through that on our with our infographic um you know KYVL now, you know, probably rising um, in value at that same rate, ease of access, um, you know, th things of that nature that that's that's the feedback that the the additional kind of deep dive feedback that we're interested in um, to, to make sure that that value is hitting exactly where, you know, we, we hoped it would. Yeah, I'm not saying that when really responding. So, you know, field staff, when you're you can just, if you can try to give a little yeah. feedback, also give people a heads up is. Um, you, you, you've heard me talk about the, the priority for if, 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 if the baseline, if the cuts are restored, um, 
we have a new kind of thing is going through. It's not really the virtual library. It's not one of the items that we would be looking for, you know, paying for them on an ongoing basis. So between now and when that money runs out, you know, districts need to find an ongoing funding source if they really want to continue that on. And I want to make uh, and provide our district CIOs with information that at the statewide level, I can show you what your district individual, if that runs into that, or what the state totally is spending out of uh, funds for that not related technology for your libraries in your schools. It's an enormous amount. So, you know, if it really is coming out of your, your budget and your budget only, it may be a discussion you have to have someone else when this money runs out to go, uh, or if you want to keep on doing it, you never keep, didn't come out of anybody's budget, it's the first time. What is the funding source that funds this ongoing? And, but I would also, you know, Marty, you know, we've talked about it, is that we're at the same place we were 10 years ago. There's not a unique way that I know of that measures how much and how many unique folks are really using it and what they're using it for, uh, which I think puts it at great risk of uh, being justified to continue on. I know we brought that to the attention of folks that lead that. They, uh, I mean, they're happy now that's all being funded, but they'll be right back that spot we were at back in 2009 um, when when we, we took an enormous cut due to the, you know, the, the mortgage home crisis and cuts and could no longer fund it and haven't funded it from our fund. But to, to our credit, and Marty and you, know, you and James, um, you know, you know, you are the ones that, you know, convinced me to redo it. But my, you know, my condition was, is when this runs out, it cannot be, you know, everybody, you know, complaining loud like it was before. They have to show how much it's really used to a unique level and identify another funding source to pay ongoing costs. This <clears> is a, David, this is just, you know, I think Mike, Mike talked earlier about our education technology planning process that we're in right now. And this is just a core uh, component of everything that we're doing with ed tech. It's, you know, is it being used? How much is it being used? And can you um, articulate the value? Um, and, and we always refer to that as impact and learning. And so um, with KYVL, with other, any other resource, whether it's a learning management system or any other instructional, you know, digital instructional resource, that that's a core question of how, how can we prove and, and wrap the, the narrative around true fact factual information of is it being used how much and um is it valuable in the learning process and that's the that's the the target right now for ky to understand thing. that you know one of our I'll close with this one of our catch master plan goals which i appreciate those that still gave that a thumbs up was talking about districts having a real way to measure how so much how much something is used and not used we're talking about virtual library here but it's everything i think on an annual basis right. you take a snapshot of how much is something used and really not used? Um, yep. And how valuable is that versus just keeping on paying for that cost over and over again uh, when it's, it's used very little? Um, uh, and, and so this is one of the areas we did PD 360 was another area that the Department of Education stopped paying for when we found out like only 5% of the teachers were using it. So this was in, in, in that, that danger zone as well, is how much is it really being used? And then during these next two years, uh, this, this time from the rest of school year, next one, is making the case for those that really, really like it, identifying a funding source in the district that pays for it on an ongoing basis. Well, that, that's all I have. Thanks uh, thanks for those that were able to hang around for that additional, additional part there. We'll hit, hit on some more of these uh, next month. Um, so hope you have a good rest of the week. Take care.